I wanted to say that, that in this panel we wanted to talk about the lived experience of some of the cities that our panelists can speak to. And that jives very much with, with, this, uh, with that human-focused idea that we talked about uh, in regards to the exhibition. And so what I'm, what I'm curious to learn about is, is when we look at the kind of, when we look at, uh, around the edges of the larger picture about the narrative of how cities are changing or how cities are responding or how states or individuals are acting in response to the changes that, uh, that we see in these cities, what, what are the kind of epi phenomena that, that we see? What is the sort of the micro level of, of, of human beings, um, culture, and society in these cities? So, um, and we also have the benefit of having um, a, a little bit of a different slate. On this panel, we have a specialist in Japan, as well as the other cities, the other regions that we've talked about tonight. So I'm really excited to hear about that comparative point of view. So let me first just uh, quickly introduce them. We have our first speaker um, is Marty, Mar Martha Chen. She's a lecturer in public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School, an affiliated professor at the Harvard GSD, an international coordinator of the Global Research Policy Action Network, Women in Informal Employment, Globalizing and Organizing, which I think you see on the screen. She's an experienced development practitioner as well as a scholar, and her areas of specialization are employment, gender, poverty, and uh, many other areas. Um, we're next going to hear from the artist Hu Shang Chang, um, who is based in Shanghai. As a precocious art student, Mr. Hu obeyed the dictate. This, this is a beautifully written bio that I'm going I'm to try to present to you. He obeyed the dictates of the time, painting in the social realist style his teachers required. In his 30s and 40s, he was able to travel, spending 15 years in Japan and making several trips to southern Africa. In its rock art and in the rough, unfinished aesthetic of Japanese folk art, he found a spontaneity, spirituality, and, op and openness to chance that realist art, openness to chance, that realist art had little place for. Today, Hu Shangsheng represents an unusual hybrid, a Chinese artist whose works are not identifiably Chinese, whose main influences are not both non-Chinese and non-Western, yet who is so attached to Chinese tradition that he has dedicated years to reviving Ming Dynasty canal villages. And our final panel speaker will be Theodore Bester. He's the Reichauer Institute Professor of Social Anthropology and Japanese Studies in the Department of Anthropology here at Harvard. He's a specialist on contemporary Japanese society and culture, focusing much of his research on Tokyo. He's written widely on urban culture and history, markets, and economic organization, including food culture, the fishing industry, and popular culture. So, uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Marty to the Sort of non-standard workplaces. They work on streets and in 
the public spaces. Many of them work at home, um, either their own home, producing goods, providing services, or in the homes of others. Some work in offices or factories or um, hotels, but the vast majority are working in public space or private homes, and our urban planning does not take that very much into account. We have measures of informal employment, but those who measure informal employment, the national governments do not agree on what is urban. <coughs> so we don't have urban data um, in, in many labor force surveys. We have data on non-agricultural employment. So this is sort of a proxy, if you will, for urban employment. And you'll see that South Asia has the highest incidence at 82% on average. Um, <coughs> quite high in Southeast Asia as well, 65%. And we do have data for six or seven cities in China, and 33% of that workforce is informal. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa would be close to South Asia if we did not include South Africa and the Southern economy. So that gives you a comparative perspective. And just to say there's a range, of course, within each region. So in the South Asia region, the lowest incidence of informal employment is Sri Lanka at around 64% and India the highest at 84 And I think in Southeast Asia the range is somewhere in the 40s for um, Thailand and 73-74% in Indonesia. This is the composition of the urban workforce in India today. 80% of the urban, India does have urban data, is um, informal, 20% is formal. If you think about the informal workforce and what sectors, what branches of industry they're involved in, you'll see that for the total, um, manufacturing and trade, mainly street trade, some market trade, uh, are very high. And non-trade services, of course, is a big lump uh, a lumpy category. For men, a lot of that is transport. For women, a lot of that is domestic work. And then if you look at the share of home-based work, where you work in your own home producing goods and services, it's 14% of the total urban workforce. But look what it is for women. One in three urban workers who are women are making things in their own homes. It's very significant. And street trade is not insignificant. And 1% or so of the urban population, not just in India, but many uh, countries of the world, earn their living from uh, sorting and reclaiming and recycling uh, waste. I'm just going to go like that. Oop. <laughs> um, two pairs of facts, I guess, that are important as to why we should be interested in the urban informal workforce. One is the links of informality and poverty. And we know we have data from a growing number of countries that most informal workers are poor. They're trying to earn an honest living, but they're stigmatized as being somehow illegal underground gray or black and our network is fighting <laughs> the, that stigmatization. Um, and on average, earnings are low, and also costs and risks are high for the informal workforce. And then if you think about informality in cities, informality, as you could see from the data, represents the broad base of the urban workforce, of the urban enterprises, and even urban output. But, cities as they modernize are becoming increasingly hostile. They're penalizing or even criminalizing informal workers. In India, if you do not have a permit or a license, you are subject to enforcement of the Indian Penal Code. And the, the street vendors can cite chapter and verse of that penal code because they are issued summary warrants and fines on a regular basis. And urban infrastructure 
schemes, the large urban infrastructure schemes, are really undermining or actually destroying livelihoods. I call it the urban juggernaut because you get these roads and boulevards and highways and flyovers coming through and it displaces, if not destroys, many, many urban livelihoods. You get modern waste management and the role of waste pickers in reclaiming is overlooked. Um, it's quite relentless. So I thought I'd share with you a tale of three Asian cities in a sort of photo essay. Um, two of the cities I don't know at all well, which is Hanoi and Shanghai. Ahmedabad, India, I know quite well. Um, and I'll just share some photos and end with a case study of this artist, artisan street vendor in Ahmedabad. When I go to Hanoi, it gives me a smile because it's such an informal city. It's everywhere. Um, the street, the sidewalks, I would say, are now occupied primarily by motorcycles. Used to be primarily by street vendors, but the street vendors, as you can see, find all kinds of ways to continue to ply and their goods. Uh, they have them over their shoulders. They fit themselves in with a little stand in between cars in a parking lot. Uh, street food culture is very popular. And um, I really like the woman who turned over an umbrella and put her, those are those paper products, that cut paper products that she was showing um, in Hanoi. But then you move to Shanghai. And the top three pictures are the model of Shanghai in that museum, I forget what it's called. But it's uh, quite a startling vision of a city. And it's a city I first went to in 79. <laughs> and uh, there was nothing across from the Bund except agriculture. Um, so it's a city that I've watched in amazement as it has grown. And then I try to find informality wherever I go, and it's very hard in Shanghai. And the only form I found was, was some bicycle carts. There's very little stationary street trade um, left, as far as I could find, in Shanghai. So I call Shanghai the formal city, Hanoi the informal city. And then the, we come to Ahmedabad, and <clears throat> Davy Ben, who's in some of these pictures, is a street vendor, but she's from an artisan caste that moved to Ahmedabad about 150 years ago from nearby neighboring Rajasthan. And her community and her husband's community um, made the images, the murti, for religious festivals out of clay and now increasingly paper mache. Um, but um, that colony, who knows Ahmedabad, Gulbai Tekra, she was from Gulbai Tekra, which was known as the Hollywood of Ahmedabad because the women were so beautiful and photogenic. Um, and what this collage shows, top left, she buys what she sells from a wholesale market, which is called the Chinese market. And what she buys and sells are very inexpensive, like clocks and posters, all with uh, Hindu gods and goddesses. So you'll have a Ganesh clock or a Hanuman clock that are made in China, and she sells them. Um, she sells from that piece of cloth on the ground, and um, she has to store her goods. In the middle, um, you'll see a purple tarp. That's a friend and she putting their goods uh, for overnight storage. Open air, against a wall. On the other side of the wall, there is a police station, so perhaps that gives some security. And then they pay the storekeeper in the, in, next door to this wall to sort of watch their goods, and they put a tarp over it and a log for at night. And the pictures show her friends and her um, carrying goods to and fro the storage site. Now the story of this um, area where she uh, sells, it's near the Bhadra Fort, which was 
built in 1411 by the Sultan of that time. And in front of the Badra Fort was an open area. It used to be his garden. And there were 4,000 vendors who had been trading there for generations until the city decided that the former garden should become a heritage plaza. So when I spent two days and two nights with Davy Ben and trying to work alongside her, the whole area where they had once been was cordoned off and they had all been squeezed into little gullies and alleys um, on either side of the fort. Now the other side of her story was that the artist colony where she once lived, the city had put a boulevard through the middle. So they had been twice relocated. And she was living in that tenement block up on the left uh, that you can see. And when I first drove up the first night, all of these images that you see in the middle and, um, and the right on the top were in the headlights of our vehicle shown as sort of this strange, surreal image around the, the base of the tenement estate. And the bottom pictures show um, Davy Ben in her home and going to collect water in the morning from the communal tap and making um, chapatis for us to eat in the evening. And she lived, I think it was the fourth floor of this tenement block. And um, where they used to live was more like a village. It was an artisan's colony, I would call it. And because of the distance between the tenement area where she now lives and, where, and the area that she markets and sells the goods, she, the transport costs have risen. So she no longer allows herself any tea during the day. She has stopped drinking tea. Uh, but of course, when we were there with her, she went and bought tea for all of us. So the question is, in her minds, what or who constitutes heritage in the city? Why does an ancient fort built in 1411 constitute heritage and not a traditional artisan village or a historic market area? And what about the artisans and the street vendors themselves? And Davy Ben asked as we talked, we are part of heritage. We are part of the culture of the city. What about us? And so I think that's a really important question as we think about cities going forward. Uh, we talk about sustainability, but there's so many dimensions to what a city should be and who it should serve. And so I just wanted to end with a vision of inclusive cities um, that the WeGo Network that I um, represent is trying to promote around the world um, in many cities in Latin America, Africa, and Asia. And this is a quote from Ila Bhatt, a very well-known um, labor lawyer, labor organizer, who is the founder of the Self-Employed Women's Association, a trade union of nearly two million women workers in India. She's also the founding chair of the WeGo Network, and she got an honorary degree at Harvard. So what she says is how we should think about cities going forward. The challenge is to convince the policymakers to promote and encourage hybrid economies in which micro-businesses can coexist along small, medium, and large businesses, in which street vendors can coexist alongside kiosks retail shops, and large malls. Just as the policymakers encourage biodiversity, they should encourage economic diversity. Also, they should try to promote a level playing field in which all sizes of businesses and all categories of workers can compete on equal and fair terms. And so when we talk about the modern and the vernacular, um, we're also talking about the formal and the informal and how to make them coexist, I think, is the challenge of our century. Thank you.
Hey, ah, uh, 各位晚上好。Good evening, everyone. 啊，哦，我是胡祥成。Yeah, 啊，再慢慢一点，先看前面。呃，这是大家看到的一些城市的大规模的城市建设。This is the construction of large metropolises. 啊，但这是房子，并不是家，是不是家要一段时间？是家园，是不是？ Uh, these are houses. They aren't necessarily homes. 然后我们看到这个房子是福建和安徽的一个祠堂。Uh, this is an ancestral temple in Anhui province. Because in China, it's a tradition that comes from the West. It's a tradition that comes from the West. The Western architecture and Western traditions have their roots in the Greek city-state. And a Chinese culture emanates from the countryside. The countryside, 为这个纽带。呃 ，the the cultural center, the heart of the countryside, is based in lineage and the bloodline. 因为这个祠堂就是家属的庙，一个家的庙，一个家族祭祭祖的一个庙。呃 ，the ancestral temple is where um one's ancestors are worshipped and remembered. 但是，呃，今天大规模城市建设以后，时代也变了。那么这个呃，这个血缘为中心的这种纽带的这种。Mm. And so this idea of a lineage or the bloodline that was central to life in the countryside has changed as the as urbanization has taken over, and what was once the central part of lineage has been replaced by a more civil or a um a kind of citizenship culture. Because this family, uh, is that this has already. And so what's happened in the cities is that the, the, the phrase that we're using here is the cellular construction of the society, but the, the, we need to have a reformation and an improvement of the cells of society, and it's a process that's ongoing but hasn't been completed yet in the cities. Uh, 呃，就变成了一个呃养蘑菇的地方，啊，养蘑菇的地方，或者是变成了一个呃拆掉以后变成一个会所，或者分解拆掉。And so the ancestral temple that you were looking at before、um, was eventually torn down, and then it was used to plant、um, mushrooms, and then it was transformed again later on into what you see here in this picture, which is kind of an event center. 那我作为一个当代艺术家，其实我十几年来一直从事两个方面的事情。Uh, and so, uh, having been an artist for this many years, these, this is the kind of phenomenon that he has been interested in and paid attention to. And so, as a, an artist, as a modern artist, you can't just raise a problem. What you have to do is offer a solution or try to help. And so the the picture that you're seeing here is his kind of the atomizing of society and the ways that needs to be improved. And you have the different sections that I think he will talk about. Ah, because this section includes the environment, the nature protection, the land protection, and then the human relationship, the different aspects of the art, and the science, the social science research. This is a whole thing because it's German. That's all. Uh, so it, what these each talk about, so you have environmental protection, you have a sort of social network that you need to be protecting, you, have, you need to be making um, architecture that responds to the people's needs, and you need to focus on education, and there's all these different components, the various components that go into making a healthy society. And so it requires establishing uh, a sort of shapeless and internal sort of uh, essence or structure to make this happen. And so all, all these buildings that before have been torn down have now been replaced by buildings that are all one and the same, uh, on the same model, in the same mold. And so these are, those are resources collected from a whole bunch of homes that have been torn down、um, from the countryside. So I, in this book, I have a lot of materials. 
And so he's decided what he was going to do was collect these pieces and take them and repurpose them into a piece of modern art. Um, this is a, 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 a factory that has gone out of business. Um, but in this area, you have um, a bridge, bridges from the Song Dynasty, the Ming Dynasty, uh, and has a lot of history to it. And so they've helped to rebuild a new structure in that, um, in the same vein, in the traditional vein. And this is the process of it being constructed. And so they want to um, retain the traditional um, art, art, artisanal methods used to build the structure. And so they have to create a new method and a new order for rebuilding these things. And so they have to create a new method and a new order for rebuilding these things. Uh, and so now we're getting into um, how to do um, the spaces for weddings and for different events for society. Uh, and so from these sort of changes that they're making on the inside, you have these external changes as well that are happening and trying to um, bring the distance between them together. And so, um, right now to focus on space, you have a traditional wedding ceremony, but in the modern times, and how do you do it? What kind of music do you pair to it? What kind of um, clothing do you wear to it? How does a space function for um, this kind of an event? Uh, and so now most modern weddings um, imitate the, the Western style of the wedding. It's no longer a traditional wedding. And so this is usually what the young people like and what they like, uh, what they prefer. Uh, these are different um, Chinese uh, festival days. Uh, and so this is a, a, a play stage or an opera stage. And in rural society, the two things that were most important were the ancestral temple and the opera stage. Uh, and so a lot of Chinese history and a lot of um, a lot of social events have gone uh, been performed on the stage uh, of these uh, of these countryside platforms. And so they created a rural um, band and had them play their own music in their own spaces as a way of trying to recreate this old uh, or this more traditional sense. Uh, and also because a lot of the people that live in these small countryside villages uh, are very marginal and they come from the outskirts of China, and so this gives them a sense of community. Uh, and so the life in the cities is so um, active that um, when you look at it from the countryside, from these marginal positions, you seem like you're getting left out, and so this helps to counteract that. Uh, and so now in the evenings, because there's these music and these platforms where they can perform, it gives the young people a place to gather uh, and have community. Uh, and so when we think about reforming the, um, the cells of society, we have to think about the countryside because this is the very foundations of it. Mm. And so we must um, work to preserve the, the seeds of our society as well as the seeds of the countryside uh, as a way of trying to start from the foundations.
呃，当然我毕竟是个艺术家，我做的事情大部分都失败了。<laughs> and so he's um, not only a practitioner of art, he also tries to put his art into action or to practice what he preaches. This is some of his modern art that he's created. There's an exhibition in Guangzhou currently where this is being displayed. 一个废弃的木料，我再重新组成树一片树林。呃 ，and so he's taken all the pieces of the old buildings that have been torn down and created a recreated a a forest out of repurposed um wood from torn down houses。我们想用一种比较特殊的方法，比如我们很多传统图案的雕花，我们不再是放在博物馆里这样看，我们种在树上面，让他们望远镜看，这是什么图案？这是什么图案？ Uh, and so what he's done in the pro process of rebuilding this is to use traditional patterns that you might find in a museum and I carved them into these old wooden pieces. And so now instead of seeing them in a museum, you see them in a live space um, and in a new setting. Uh, and so this is the last time in, uh, in Shanghai when he gave an exhibit uh, with the character for Chai, which means to dismantle. This is uh, a picture of Lu Ban, who is um, kind of become a saint of sorts uh, in the agricultural sector. Uh, but this uh, particular piece of art is called Lu Ban is very confused. Lu Ban, see so many monuments, don't know how to make it. Yeah, you put, you put him in the middle of this architecture in the city, and he doesn't know what to do with it all. So my this work is not just me alone. It's many scholars who have taken it to me. And so his artwork is not his own. It's uh, something that's been a collective project of, uh, of a cultural accumulation over years that he's borrowing from to make a point. So Lu Ban, don't be worried. He also took it to him. He doesn't need to be. Um, he doesn't need to worry on his own. He has people with him. Ah, we'll go further. Ah, further, further, further. So drawn. Ah, further, further, further. Ah, this is my one series of paintings. So it's more, more photographs of his artwork. This, this, many of the burned out paintings, some paintings, are already burned. The construction is no longer possible. We put them in the in the in the exhibit. This is the exhibit. This is the exhibit. And so many of these wooden pieces that he is showing you here have fallen off or unable to be used in building things. And so they've taken and put them and imprinted them into these bricks. And so now you can use these bricks with these patterns in, uh, on them to build new buildings and retain the culture. And so memory is made of many things. It's made of language, it's made of words, but it's also made of patterns and images, and this is his way of contributing to that. Uh, and so no matter, matter which it is, it's always part of um, society's intellectual history. Uh, and so again, you have another frame here uh, of the artwork that he's created, and so you see the, the houses being um, floating away. Uh, and so if you look at this, this is an image of a, of a gun. Uh, and so this is, uh, yeah, it's an image of a gun from a, a, a cement factory that went under, uh, that he's repurposed, and, yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, this is a representation also of how the economy uh, has hit rock bottom. Uh, and so he's taken all of these pieces of um, buildings that have fallen apart and been torn down and put this in there. And so this is meant to represent an unstable, um, an unstable time in which we're living. Uh, 
Uh, and so this is images of an opera that has been performed since the Ming Dynasty uh, in uh, and, uh, Huizhou. Huizhou, Huizhou. In Huizhou. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 呃，但是这个，但是这些人因为没有人支持他们，现在就在各地打工，这个分散掉了。Uh, and so, because so many people were unwilling to support the project, the people and the group had disbanded and were、um, working part time in different places across the country. 因为这个戏是真正的这个戏的起源的，好像它是每天是半夜里面演的，不是白天演的，十二点钟半夜开始演。Uh, and so this、uh, opera traditionally is performed in the middle of the night and not during the day. 民间称它鬼戏。Uh, and people call it the the ghost opera. 实际上，它是真正是祭祖啊，或者驱神、驱鬼啊、祈福啊，和这个和和社会发生的事件有关。Uh, and so this has thing is related to all of the, the 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 kind of dubious things that go on in society, and it's meant to help expel these、uh, things from people、um, from your life. 政府啊，现在对这这方面也有知识，但是但是还是不太够。Uh, the government now is starting to support these kind of projects, but the support is not enough. 所以这些这个戏呢，就是。呃，有时候，因为他们有时候可以一个戏可以演演演呃几十天。Uh, and so one performance of this opera uh, theoretically can last several days or can go on for several days at a time. 啊，这个呃呃，这是呢，就是另外一个事情。这个一个水泥漏斗，这个水呃，这个是一个装煤的一个工厂，在龙美术馆。上海一个很非非非常新的一个美术馆叫龙美术馆。呃、uh, ，and so this is in one of the Shanghai、uh, museums. 龙龙龙美术馆。哦、oh, okay, ，哎，那龙 museum. 呃，它的那个、那个、那个、那个漏洞是放那个煤的。呃、uh, ，and so in the， 放煤的。呃、uh, ，and the hole you， 呃，放煤嘛。放煤的。哦 ，and so you um put coal， 呃 ，in in the hole that's created there。呃，我这个因为这个煤现在这个一个空气啊污染什么，这个这个不用了。And so this is to kind of uh fight against the air pollution and the other um contaminants in the air。因为煤本来就是几呃呃几多少亿年以前的这个阳光。Mm. And so this is because it was meant to use、uh, be used for light in the past. He's repurposed the idea of light here. 所以我做这个作品作为这个最后，呃，这个作品前一阵子做的，就阳光、空气和水。And so this is supposed to be with、uh, light, uh, 阳光、uh, water and、uh, air. 这个就是那那个水桶。And so the bottom is a、um, a water rec receptacle. 这是射下来的光。And so the the light is shooting down into it. 那么，呃呃呃呃，无论哪个民族，这个这个地域文化都是人类的重要的部分。我希望像孔子说的，在阳光、空气，所以我们有共同的价值观。但是，希望君子和而不同，但世界有共同的价值观，又保持了各地的文化。不能因为我们有了共同而牺牲了各地的文化。嗯、um, ，And so you see the the water flowing down in. What he's trying to get at overall is that these are all、um, jointly used resources, and that although we each may approach them from our own perspective, that、um, there's a similar and a shared kind of value judgment that goes into these things. We all need them. We all share them. And he hopes that this project helps to、um, bring that point home. Ah, 谢谢 Thank you. Uh, good evening.、Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this to participate in this.、Uh, it's always a bit of a challenge when you follow an artist,、um, <laughs> because what、uh, what Mr. Hui has, who has、uh, shown is, is certainly going to be far more interesting than what I have to show, I think. But in any case, I'll do my best.、Um, I'm an anthropologist. I study Tokyo, and my interest, at least in the context of this kind of a, an event. Um, is I'm interested in the relationship between the built environment and society,、uh, and the ways in which the built environment has changed.、Um, just to give you a very quick overview, and I'm not even going to bother trying to read this.、Um, this takes us from the late 19th century to the 1964 Olympics,
uh, and the number of times that the city has either been uh, reconstructed or destroyed. Uh, and then beyond the 1964 Olympics, um, oops, sorry, um, another set of, um, uh, how shall I say, dislocations uh, have taken place as a result of prosperity, real estate development, uh, and so forth. Uh, so I couldn't possibly, in the time available tonight, try and give you a, an overview of all of the changes of the, vision of, the, of the built environment and their social impacts, although many of them would correspond um, in some way or other to uh, what uh, Professor Chen uh, suggested earlier about uh, the informal and the formal, uh, the existence of a street economy, the disappearance of a street economy, uh, and so forth. So tonight I'm just simply going to focus on the, the uh, planning uh, for the upcoming uh, 2020 Tokyo Olympics. Uh, and I'll use as sort of my st starting point the previous uh, Tokyo Olympics, which were in 1964. Uh, I won't go into it, but the 1964 Olympics were themselves built in part on the infrastructure uh, that was put in place for the 1940 Olympics in Tokyo, which you've never heard of because they were canceled uh, as a result of the outbreak of World War II. Uh, but in any case, Tokyo and the Olympics have a long history, uh, and it shows up in a variety of ways. I keep going the wrong way. Certainly, uh, Kenzo Tange, the famous uh, um, architect, uh, had Harvard affiliations, is responsible for some of the most glorious architecture of the uh, 1964 Olympics. Uh, this is a this is the uh, the official arena. Uh, this is a schematic of it. It's a very very beautiful, graceful building. Um, and this is more of his architecture on the site. Uh, Tange, in a sense, uh, created modern Tokyo in the early 1960s with monumental architecture of a variety of, of sorts. Um, what follows Tange, however, is commercial uh, architecture, and the most recent, um, or one of the most recent developments is uh, this Mori complex at Ropongi Hills. Mori is a major real estate developer and he has built five or six major complexes in Tokyo with the idea that these would become self-contained urban cells, if you will. So this complex includes offices, it includes uh, residence, residential uh, buildings, it includes um, uh, high-end shops, uh, it has uh, all of the sorts of um, uh, French Parisian fashion houses that you might imagine. Uh, and he has quite consciously uh, built this with the idea of creating something that in his view is uh, sort of like a Rockefeller Center uh, as a sophisticated urban magnet, uh, which has no relationship whatsoever uh, to its surroundings. He's also a patron of the arts and uh, has put a lot of effort into uh, promoting the work of uh, Murakami, um, the uh, super flat artist who is sort of the official uh, residence in, uh, artist in residence for the uh, Mori uh, Corporation. Uh, and so the uh, Ropongi Hills complex is celebrated in all kinds of ways. Uh, Mori being a good capitalist has also created uh, the Ropongi Hills version of Monopoly, uh, which you uh, see here. Now, as I said, Tokyo 2020 is uh, the current operating uh, scheme for the redevelopment of Tokyo uh, in a variety of ways, which I'll try and talk about briefly uh, to give you some sense of, what have I done here now, just a second. Um, some of the salutary things about planning are that in recreating the city uh, for 2020, uh, some of the, the error, errors of uh, 1964 planning and subsequent real estate development are being addressed. Uh, so, for example, in the last several years, um, uh, outmoded buildings from the 1960s and 1970s have been dismantled uh, in order to 
uh, provide uh, wind uh, access to central Tokyo, which had gotten walled off from the natural winds from the bay because of overdevelopment. Uh, so this is, an, in a sense, an opportunity to clear out uh, some of the outmoded uh, real estate and bring back natural wind patterns uh, to the central city, uh, hence reducing heat during the summer and so forth. Um, another aspect of uh, Olympic planning, this is a uh, not atypical street utility pole in, in central Tokyo. Uh, the, Government has decided that these are unsightly. It's only taken them 75 years or so to realize this. Uh, and so they are in the process of replacing utility poles by moving the utilities underground and using the sites for each removed pole uh, as a place to plant a new tree. And the uh, goal is by 2020 uh, to have planted one million trees uh, in the place of utility. Uh, polls. Whether that's going to happen, uh, what its effect will be, uh, is quite startling because if you've spent much time in Tokyo, you'll realize it's not a city that has a lot of street trees. Uh, so it will be a very interesting and nice uh, development. Another, uh, this is another legacy of 1964. Uh, this is Nihonbashi, the central uh, bridge in Tokyo that is symbolically the center of the nation, uh, symbolically the place from which all distances are <laughs> are uh, measured uh, in, this, in the run-up to the 64 Olympics. A freeway was built over the canal uh, and over, um, over Nihonbashi itself. And there's a movement afoot to uh, dismantle this highway, uh, restore the waterway. It's inspired in part by the efforts of Seoul to do the same sort of thing by removing uh, uh, infrastructure that covers rivers. This is uh, Nihonbashi in its glory. Um, obviously, it will not go back to anything like that, uh, but the aim is to restore it to some kind of a, a traditional um, urban, urban scape where people can enjoy the land and the water um, simultaneously as opposed to this dark and, and kind of grim looking uh, canal that it has become. This is another aspect of the planning for the uh, 2020 Olympics. This is Zaha Hadid's plan for the uh, major stadium. Uh, it has been compared to a bicycle helmet um, and many other things. It has also now been rejected by uh, the Japanese government. They had given her the contract, uh, but then the cost overruns um, uh, soared, and so the, the contract has been withdrawn. This will not be built, but this is also a reflection of uh, organized um, protest movements against the Olympic planning, saying that it's too expensive and also too wasteful of space. And if you look at this, this um, architectural drawing and compare the scale of that, uh, that structure to the surrounding areas, you'll see that there's, a, there's a real questions about the, the compatibility of one kind of space versus another. Uh, and this is also, oops, sorry, uh, this is also uh, related to uh, questions of congestion. Uh, the, this is, uh, the, the yellow circle is an eight kilometer uh, radius of, around the central part of Tokyo in which all of the, most of the Olympic uh, facilities will be uh, built. Um, and if you look at this map, if, you, if you're familiar at all with Tokyo, uh, you'll see that this covers not only the waterfront and the various areas where facilities will be built, but it also overlaps substantially with the older residential districts of Tokyo. Uh, and so the Olympics are seen by many uh, as um, sort of the last stand for cultural heritage and preservation of older uh, neighborhoods and the lifestyles, including the informal sectors uh, that go along with them. Uh, my own research has focused on the Tsukiji market, uh, which is the world's largest seafood market um, uh, located in central Tokyo. If I go back to this map, uh, Tsukiji currently is right about there, uh, and it's going to be moved to right about there um, in order to create space for uh, the Olympics. So this is the current uh, Tsukiji market. Uh, including its very vibrant outer marketplace, uh, an, an informal market where 
consumers can shop uh, from street peddlers and, and established shops. It will be moved uh, to a, a futuristic market spot far away from any of the rest of the urban fabric, so it will be separated from residential neighborhoods, separated from informal markets, and so forth, and become a very uh, mechanized, if you will, uh, distribution center. Uh, so the social consequences of the kinds of built environment issues that I've been uh, looking at recently include improvements in infrastructure, opening up air, uh, green space, opening waterways, making the physical landscape of the city more livable uh, in a variety of ways, but it's also uh, pushing out established facilities like Tsukiji, uh, pushing out uh, small businesses, uh, pushing out the, the, the kind of informal city uh, that, that Marty was describing, uh, and turning the central part of, um, of the city into a non-residential uh, region. And just to give you a brief view, this is an example of the kind of residential neighborhood uh, that exists around Skiji today and exists uh, in many parts of the area that I sort of broadly outlined on the map. Uh, of very closely, densely packed uh, houses, uh, but uh, low, um, low construction uh, and by and large neighborhoods in which um, families and landowners have been in place for several generations at least. So this is the last remnant of the, of the kind of city that Tokyo was before World War II and in the early 1950s. And I would say if you want to see this part of uh, Tokyo, go before 2020 uh, because it won't be there afterwards just as the, the, the Beijing Olympics uh, re restructured uh, Hutong and various other aspects of traditional life. So I will stop there. Um, thank you again for your patience and listening to me. And I'll be happy to answer questions. So are we moving? We, I think we do need to finish by 8.30, so we just have a few minutes for questions, and I, um, and I want to open it up to the audience, but I just want to say I, I, um, I think there were some wonderful cross-currents among these three panels. Some of the questions that, that came to my mind, to put it very simply, are, um, you know, what is worth preserving in a city, and, and from when? Is it the, the earliest roots of the city? Is it the buildings of the 1960s? Um, is it the ancestral temples? I mean, who, what, are the, what is worth preserving? Who gets to decide which things are worth preserving? And, and then finally, if, if, it is, if the reality is that, in fact, we need something, uh, cities need to be more, um, as you suggested, hybridized and diverse, then, um, so that you have preservation somehow integrated with you, or you have the old integrated with the new somehow. What are the forces that are arrayed against that and, or that can be um, mobilized towards creating that sort of a cityscape um, in the places that we're discussing tonight? So that is what is on my mind, but I would uh, I'd immediately like to, to ask if the audience has any questions they'd like, like to raise. feel to me like the conflicting priorities of preserving an informal workplace and then our at least Western interests in food safety and environmental safety and not having things contaminated by lead and having and making sure that you know what you're buying what you what you think you're buying is what you're buying um, and how do you and negotiating uh, those two things. You want me to? Okay. <laughs> Are these on? Is it on? Yes, okay. Um, thank you for that question. And um, 
the street food vendors that I know and the small caterers um, are themselves very concerned about public safety and, and health when it comes to the food they serve. And what they need and want from the city is water supply, shelter, um, sanitation in the natural markets or even the built markets uh, where they operate. And we have some costing of how much they themselves invest in these kinds of um, infrastructure services that are necessary to, um, to keep the food healthy. Um, and the question is whether the city will help in that regard as well. So I think it's not that they are not concerned, it's that they are forced to work under really difficult circumstances. And yet we know that street food culture is very uh, dynamic and alive and well. You th think of a modern city like Bangkok, and you come down off the expressways and you hit the street, and um, the street food culture is there, and the public, the middle class, the elite support it. So somehow um, the hygiene issues are being dealt with. But the street food vendors would appreciate more from the cities to help them. I'd just add to that that in, in Japan, the, the food safety issues are generally the, the fault of large food manufacturing companies that have purposely adulterated their products. It's not street food that's going to kill you. It's uh, some of the dairy companies in Japan. I had actually a uh, question for both Hugh and Theodore. Um, you guys are looking at kind of maintaining the, the cultural uh, history, and mostly um, you've got in the 1960s um, context of the Olympics a homage to cultural um, historical sites. And then also in Japan you have the heritage sites being maintained as uh, unlike Western heritage sites, instead of letting them break down and fall apart, they actually try to maintain form rather than just maintain material. Mm. Um, is it the case that you find in, in the context of Tokyo that there is an interest in maybe not keeping what is actually present currently, but making sure that there's a cultural maintenance of, of that kind of history and then the same uh, Hugh, in your experience, in um, in China. Shall I answer first, and you can? Sure. You, you. Um, I think I think the level of interest really varies, um, and the dominant ethos, uh, the the sort of the government business uh, ethos, is um, cultural heritage is is castles in Kyoto and temples and things like that, and the urban. The urban streetscape of Tokyo is not cultural heritage. It is, it is property to be developed. Um, I think, though, there are a lot of ordinary residents of Tokyo, particularly the areas that are most affected by this, who would argue that it's not simply the physical infrastructure, but it's the, the nature of community. It's the kinds of neighbor-to-neighbor uh, -neighbor ties. It's the, it's the. Um, the, the life that, that builds up on back alleys where people are you know, in and out of each other's houses all the day. That's the sort of thing that, that should be preserved and to preserve it means preserving the infrastructure around it. Or preserve. So it's not, just, it's not just the preservation of a nice old house, uh, it's preservation of a way of life which enables people who live in those houses to continue to have a a uh, livelihood because many of these neighborhoods are essentially mercantile um, in the sense that people's houses are also their workplaces. Uh, they're, I mean, much like what you were saying. I mean, the, the, the house is not just a home, it's, a, it's an economic unit as well. And so if, the, if that isn't respected by the planners, then, then the whole neighborhood or the whole region sort of withers away. So I think it's a it's a very difficult problem, and I don't think that 
I don't think that the political economy of Tokyo is going to change sufficiently in the next decade or so to really preserve a lot of these kinds of parts of the urban landscape and urban economy. Mm. Tasu 不是做给人家看的要。All right, we'll give that a shot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and he was referencing back to the uh, the food safety question from before, oh. and talking about the needs of the people and uh, how to preserve. Um, certain cultural elements, and so part of that has to do with going back to the livelihoods of the people in the countryside, for, in the Chinese case, uh, and looking at the needs the, uh, of the people from back there. And so one of the things he talks about is the social, like a social welfare system and a social, social welfare infrastructure um, is necessary to, in order to um, to kind of enable these things to happen. Right now, um, there is a need for it that is not being met. And so it starts in the countryside and it needs to happen also, um, I guess the government needs to intervene and help to give back on this respect to make that possible. I think that, um, I think unfortunately that we need to bring our evening to a close, but I do hope that maybe there's a chance for a few more questions as, we, as we're on our way out. Um, I just want to say thank you for all the wonderful, stimulating um, presentations tonight from all of the panelists, and thank you to SAI. Um, I have, my mind is just overflowing with ideas, and, um, and I'm going to be really excited to go to my job tomorrow and look at the art through the lens of all these presentations. So thank you very much. Thank you.